right, good morning. Once again, happy Lord's Day Sunday. What we often refer to as church is a place that we go, usually once a week or so, uh, to gather with other believers and celebrate our communion, our common union, as we just did, which is our faith in Jesus. We like to say, I'm going to church. I'm going to go to church. Now, as Christians, you and I can worship God anytime we want. We can do it in our car while we're on the freeway, as I often do. You know, as we often do, we'll be praying as we're driving to work, whatever. We can individually worship God through prayer and through song. That has not been outlawed yet today. You can sing it home to the Lord. And, and through the Word of God. You know, we're supposed to really get... The word of God inside of us and that's not going to happen if you only open your Bible once a week when the pastor says now open your Bible so we can do lots of things individually and there's something even more special when we assemble together we worship God corporately as the body of Christ which is the most I don't know if you realize how special that is it's a unique thing the church age begins on Pentecost, ends at the rapture. It's a finite period of time and it's so unique. We are like nothing else on the planet. We're not even from here anymore. Our citizenship is where? In heaven. We are ambassadors for Christ. I was talking to somebody recently about being an ambassador. An ambassador represents where he's from or she is from. An ambassador may have absolutely no connection with the culture in which they've been placed uh, and, and no agreement with it, but they're not allowed to try to change the system. They're simply to represent where they're from. That's what the church is to be. And when we share the Lord's Supper, as we've done this morning, uh, we do it in remembrance of him who died and rose again. And it is, as I said earlier, both an individual and a corporate expression at the same time. It's simultaneously that vertical relationship that we have now with our Heavenly Father, because Jesus made that possible. It's also a horizontal relationship as we recognize and cherish others in the body of Christ. How many of us, in fact, know that the church is not the building we're sitting in? Amen. It's not the campus where we meet. It's the people. The people who have chosen to trust Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And that is the church. The earliest church, the earliest believers following the day of Pentecost, they didn't have a building to go to. Um, nor did they confine their fellowship to one day a week. They met every day in the temple courts. Can you imagine that? Let's have church every day. Well, you, you can do it if you want to. They did it. But we need a building. No, you don't. And if they wanted something more intimate, they would meet in homes. Usually there'd be somebody in the area that had a home appropriate to a fairly decent bunch of people gathering. And they'd probably sit around like in a living room situation. We're not set up like the early church. We're set up like an audience with a show. We have. Uh, the seats out there and we have whatever's going on up here. The early church didn't do anything like that. They would just kind of sit around a room together. Remember when Paul would preach at, at a home church and Paul was a loquacious individual. Uh -huh. Paul preached one time so long, in fact it says he went on and on. <laughs> now we know a few preachers that could do that, but Paul was good at it and he preached so long that one of the guys that was there in the, in the in the upper room at the home church uh, named Eutychus, he fell asleep. Now, I've preached from this pulpit before, and I've seen, I won't name the person, fall asleep on a regular basis. So people, you know, our attention spans are not what we think they are. They're pretty short. Eutychus falls asleep, falls out the window, and dies. Had to be a second story, right? You probably, if you fell out this window, okay, here in the chapel, you'd still be okay. So then Paul goes out, lays hands on him, <laughs> raises him from the dead, they go back in and he finishes the sermon. <laughs> that was church back then. That was it. <laughs> so, 
And the, the early church did everything right. There was a real purity to their doctrine and to the way that they viewed uh, who they were in the Lord. This is the description of the early church from Acts chapter 2. And as I read it to you this morning, I want you to think how far we have departed from the purity of this early church. It says this, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. By the way, a lot of people think that's optional. Jesus doesn't indicate that it is, but, well, I don't know, I might get baptized one day. Uh, that wasn't the way it was. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to the church. Isn't that great? Would you like to see that happen today? And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and had divided them among all as anyone might have need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. I think sometimes we get so complicated trying to be church. Mm -hmm. Simplicity of heart. Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. That's Acts 2, 41 to 47. Now lately, as we've seen, there is much anger today among church leaders and church people. Anger toward a secular government which has so regulated what churches can and cannot do during this coronavirus pandemic that shouts are going up, fists are being raised, and people are referring to the taking away of our First Amendment rights, which I cannot find in here. <laughs> and they're complaining about the tra draconian measures being applied to churches while protests and other kinds of gatherings are allowed to continue unrestrained. It doesn't really make a lot of sense, but that's what we've come to. Have we come so far in what we today call church that we've forgotten? that the church is not a building, is not a facility, it's the people. Can the government shut you down as a believer? It cannot do that. It can restrict, restrict how we assemble, perhaps, or what we do when we assemble. But the church is still the church. The church has not been shut down, amen? Amen. Right. So much of what has characterized the early church is missing today, I believe. They talked about steadfastness in doctrine, Today, truth is whatever you think it is. Your truth is your truth, my truth is my truth. Folks, that's not Bible faith, that's Hinduism. Amen. Steadfastness in fellowship. Doesn't the Bible tell us, no, do not neglect the assembling together of yourselves as is the habit of some. Do not do that. That's an imperative, do not. A lot of people consider the assembling together optional. If I feel up to it, I'll go. If I want to sleep in, I'll sleep in. If I have a tee off time at the golf course and it conflicts with church, I'm playing golf. It's not what the Bible teaches. Steadfastness in fellowship has been pretty much made a personal option for you to decide if you want to go, don't go. The early church, this is interesting, cared so much about meeting the needs of other Christians that they sold their possessions and redistributed the money to those that had need. That's a foreign concept to most of the church today. And uh, it shows that they care. Now somebody says, well, that's, that's bordering on socialism. <gasps> that's practically communism. <gasps> no, that's love. Mm -hmm. That's love for your fellow brother and sister. And they, they held back nothing in their expression of love. When the Bible says in Acts chapter 2 that fear came upon every soul, it speaks of the sense of awe that you felt when you assembled as the church gathered in Jesus' name. Think about what it means to have the Son of God as your Savior. The Son of God came and died for you and saved you from eternal peril and has guaranteed you everlasting life. That's an awesome thing. Don't you think that's awesome? Right? I think the church today has largely lost its sense of awe. 
much absent today. It's been replaced with a casual approach to church. Let's just have fun. Let's just have a happy day. Church becomes a, communion is a happy meal. Amen? <laughs> we should give a little toy with communion. Oh. You know? Um, the sense of awe is missing. The casualness is diminished it, and I think it completely disregards the essential meaning and the character of a word, holiness. Holy God, think about holiness. Think about holy. Only thou art holy, we sing. Amen? Amen. Now here's the awesomeness. Here's where the awe comes in. Because of the blood of Jesus, because of your faith in the power of his name, his blood, and his resurrection, God now calls you holy. He calls you his hagiah, his holy ones. That's pretty awesome. Do I, is it a feeling? No, there's days when I feel anything, but it's a fact in salvation. Now we're holy. That's, that should be all inspiring. So yes, we've been told by our government that we must restrict our numbers, socially distance ourselves, wear masks, wash our hands for 20 seconds, not 10, not 15, 20 seconds. Do not pass, right? Do not pass those offering and communion plates. No, 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 no. And now we have the latest. No singing in church. And no chanting. That doesn't really apply to Protestant churches, but it hits the Catholics pretty hard. What next? No preaching? Think about it. What if the preacher is COVID-19 positive but asymptomatic? And his preaching is so forceful that he's literally projecting saliva droplets out onto the congregation and, and causing them to be carriers and maybe they'll go home and kill grandma and grandpa. So maybe no preaching is next. I don't know. We have forgotten what church is, I think. What church means. The Greek New Testament word is ekklesia, which means to be called out. Called out of sin called out of self, called out of worldliness and worldly thinking, called to righteousness, faithfulness, and holiness. We're the called out ones. We don't need a building or a campus to do that, do we? We really don't. We're used to that, but it's not essential. We may come to the point in church history before Jesus comes to get us out of here, where we may have to go back into homes. We may have to go back underground. It could happen. We did that for years. We had home church for years. It was fine. It was blessed. It was beautiful. So rethink what you think church is. Keep that in mind. We don't need a building. We don't need a campus. We don't need, you know, fountains and all kinds of accoutrements to, you know, thrill us visually and so forth. All we need is each other. And uh, we do need to assemble, as Hebrew says, to encourage others and to be encouraged by them. I need you to encourage me when we get together. You need each other to encourage each other. To encourage you in what? That your faith may stay strong and that it will not fail. We need that. Nobody else but the body of Christ is going to say that for you. No one else can. They don't get it. We can do that in homes. We can do that in a courtyard. We can do that in a parking lot. We can even do that under a pepper tree. Because we are the church. Amen? Amen. We are the church. <laughs> in the third message, we're coming to it now, in the third message to the churches in Asia, Jesus addresses the issues, and every church has them, of the church at Pergamos. Uh, follow with me if you'd like. I'll be reading from Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 to 19. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. Because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, 
By the way, one of the tenets of the Council of Jerusalem, when they understood that Gentiles were going to be part of this new thing called church, was that they not be told not to eat things sacrificed to idols. It was just a, an area that would cause problems for their fellow brothers and sisters from, from other backgrounds. So that's why it's in there. I know you and I don't think of that today. We go have a hamburger at Wendy's and we don't really think about did they sacrifice that to an idol? I don't know. Um, so this was a, a sticking point, if you will, for the early church. And to commit sexual immorality. Is there sexual immorality creeping into the church today? No, <laughs> never happened. You go back 50 years, I'm a little older than that, but you go back 50 years, and when you see what has happened to the church today, you would say, that could never, that's impossible. That could never happen. Here we are. Goes on to say, thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. He mentioned that earlier in the Ephesian message, that Nicolaitans apparently had a similar doctrine to the Balaamites that involved sexual immorality and just take the grace of God and have fun. Because after all, you're saved by grace through faith. You can do whatever you want. No, that's, that's, not, that's not letting the Holy Spirit change us to be more like Christ. He then says, which he says to five out of seven of these churches, repent or else. And here it is. Or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. And he has started by identifying himself as he who has the sharp two-edged sword. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes. I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written which no one knows except him who receives it. Some of the imagery in apocalyptic literature is a little bit vague in terms of trying to nail it with your, you know, put your finger right on it, but we'll, we'll take a look at that in a minute. But as with every church message, back to verse 12, he identifies himself, the speaker, Jesus, identifies himself in a particular way. And here he is, he who has the sharp two-edged sword. That doesn't sound like good news is about to follow, does it? Greetings. How you doing? I got a sharp two-edged sword. <laughs> Welcome. It's like, oh man, what do we do now? Um, when John saw Jesus back in Revelation chapter 1, you might recall he wrote this. He had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Now that's not to be taken as literal imagery. It's figurative imagery. The two-edged sword, if it's coming out of his mouth, it's words. He is the word of God. And in Hebrews 4 and 12, we read this. The word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. If you've noticed, as you delve into drink in, read the Word of God. It has this interesting trait to it. It shows you what's in your heart. As only the Word of God can do. It is a discerner of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Remember, it is the thoughts and intentions of the heart that Jesus is watching over, that we need to watch over. Proverbs says, above all, guard your heart. Right? The Sermon on the Mount made it very clear. Even if you didn't do it, but you thought about it, you're still guilty. The thoughts and intentions of the heart. We need to purify our hearts, do we not? And only God can help us with that. How do we do that? Through the Word. The Word of God will help us to purify our hearts. And so Jesus is the one who holds this two-edged sword, which pierces to the the vision of soul and spirit and discerns the thoughts and intentions of the heart. When you think of Jesus, do you immediately picture, oh, he's the Prince of Peace. He's, he's, just, he's just the nicest fellow. And yet, it was Jesus who said in Matthew 10, do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. 
For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. What was he saying? He's not saying he came to destroy family relationships. He's saying he's brought a sort of decision. You're going to have to make a decision about Jesus. You're going to choose him or you're going to choose someone else. Your wife, your kids, someone else is in front of him. He says, you can't, you can't do that and follow me. And so he's brought this sort of decision and you have to choose him or choose something else. The church at Pergamos has chosen other things. They have compromised their love for Jesus by also loving the world and the things of the world. They've become a worldly church, a compromised church. Many churches today have gone that same route. That's why I think all of these messages are relevant as much today as when they were written. So Jesus is bringing the church at Pergamos a, a sharp word of correction. Some funny thing about a two-edged sword, it cuts both ways. He's going to correct them doctrinally and also to the things they have allowed to enter into their fellowship, unrestrained, unrebuked. Look with me again at verses 13 and forward. He says, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, or witness is the word, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine, there it is, the doctrine of Balaam. You remember Balaam was the guy that uh, Balak hired to curse Israel. He was a prophet for hire. There's a lot of people in churches today that are prophets for hire, preachers for hire, teachers for hire. That's the way of Balaam. Peter describes it in 2 Peter 2.15. Those who are in the era of Balaam who think that you can use the body of Christ to feather your nest, so to speak. False teachers do that all the time. It's not hard to find them either. Um, the fun story of Balaam, you can go back and read it in Numbers 23 to 25. He's the one who was willing to take money from Balak to go and curse Israel. God stopped him and said, what do you think you're doing? He said, well, I, got, I just made some money. You gotta go and curse Israel. He says, no, no, no. You can go, but you say what I tell you to say. So he couldn't curse him, and Balak's getting mad, and uh, sends him back again, and the same thing happens again. God says, no, 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 no. You can only say what I tell you to say. And then finally, He's, he's riding his donkey down the road to go curse, it's a funny story, to go curse Israel. And an angel of the Lord, whom he cannot see, an angel of the Lord is standing in his way. The donkey can see the angel. <laughs> Balaam can. That's so often true, isn't it? It's a metaphor for just, well, lots of things. But so the angel of the Lord is standing in the path and the donkey tries to turn to the left. Balaam says, cut that out. Beats him, gets him back on the path. Angel stops him again. Cut that. And he's beating his donkey because if only the donkey sees it. We're not supposed to be doing this. Mm -hmm. And then finally, um, the donkey turns around and talks to him. Says, God, open the mouth of the donkey. And the donkey says, why are you beating me? What you, wouldn't that get your attention? <laughs> I mean, I, I watched, you know, the TV show Mr. Ed for years. And I understand that, you know. No one can talk to a horse, of course, unless, of course, this is a famous Mr. Ed. But Balaam was the first. His donkey turned around and spoke to him and said, I haven't done anything wrong. And then the angel of the Lord showed himself and appeared to Balaam and he said, oh, okay, got it, thank you, I'll, I'll turn around. Funny story, Numbers 22. Anyway, but Balaam was a prophet for hire. And he eventually convince Balak, here's how you infect Israel, get the Moabite women to marry into the Israelite men, and their sexual immorality is gonna go right out the window, and it, it, it did happen. And so he's credited with that. Um, what's interesting here is Jesus suggesting that, not suggesting, but stating, that where Pergamos is located is where Satan's throne is. How many of you want to live in a town where Satan has his throne there, that that's his main base of operations from there? I mean, we've got enough demonic activity in Chatsworth. I get that. 
and I, I believe there are demonic assignments over lots of principalities and, and towns and counties and states. And that's, that's how he works. But um, what Jesus is saying, I understand there's a lot of spiritual opposition to your trying to pursue holiness, righteousness, faithfulness. I get that. Um, Pergamos was both the provincial capital of the Roman Empire, which was entirely opposed to Jesus, and it was also the home to a number of pagan temples, like the Temple of Zeus, one of the most famous. So Jesus understands what we're dealing with. He, he knows what's going on around us, and he takes that into account. However, that's not an excuse. It's not an excuse for the church to allow false teachers in the tradition of Balaam, a prophet for hire, or to for the church to allow heretical doctrine, like the Nicolaitans had, which encouraged a libertine approach to grace. You know, we're under grace. We're not under the law. Therefore, you know, party party party. Because you're under grace, we're to stand firm in that grace and not use it as an excuse to let worldliness into the church, doctrinal impurity, sexual immorality, all these things went unconfronted in Pergamos. This church has compromised its integrity by allowing worldly philosophies and cultural pressure, sound familiar? To make them look more like the world than like those whom Jesus called out of the world. Sexual immorality has been culturally either redefined as a personal choice, just like abortion. No, it's, it's not baby killing, it's a woman's right to choose. Find that in the scripture, please. It's very sad what people in the church who call themselves followers of Jesus will allow or condone. Same sex relationships, personal choice. Not in the church, my friend. Sorry. Um, oh, this it might have been hate speech, and I just recorded it. I could, I could be in trouble. <laughs> I don't hate people who think wrongly. I care about them enough to tell them the truth. I mean, I love them. I want them to know the truth. I want to see them in the kingdom. Absolutely. But for a church to just turn a blind eye and a, and a wink and a nod to things that God said are unacceptable, it's happening all over the Protestant church today. It's not a sin, it's a syndrome. <laughs> you can't help it, after all. Try using the word sin in conversation with an unbeliever today. I can almost guarantee you, you will be mocked. The word sin is archaic, it's out of touch old-fashioned and it probably means you're a right-wing extremist most likely for using that word there's a very large church in Texas that the preacher absolutely says he will not use that word you know what I'm talking about he won't preach against sin he won't talk about sin we want to talk about a happy time your best life today try using the word sin with an unbeliever watch what happens you'll see I was reading a sermon that John MacArthur had done some time ago about this passage, his church at Pergamos, and one of the comments that he made I thought was worth repeating. He said, the church will not be destroyed by persecution, but by compromise. Now there's kind of a little bit of good news here in that Jesus states that not everyone in Pergamos has the problem, it's there are those among you who hold these aberrant doctrines. And, and he says, I will come and I will deal with them. Look how he says that, uh, verse 16. Repent or else I will come to you quickly and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. But in saying that, it is the whole church that needs to repent of this activity. Those that are involved in it and those that are allowing it. He says, repent, Pergamos. I'll deal with them personally. And, and finally, the, the message in every church, uh, message that we have in Revelation 2 and 3, the challenge comes at the end of each message where it, it says this, and you would, it sounds simplistic, but think about it. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says 
to the churches. That is a challenge for the church when they hear the word of God coming their way. Take it seriously. Don't disregard it. Don't harden your heart to the word of God. And then there's a promise always attached to each of these messages. This one's a little bit cryptic. I'll do with it what I can figure out. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. What does that mean? I'm not sure, but I know this. Jesus said, God gave your forefathers manna to eat in the wilderness. And he says, that was pointing to me. I am the manna. I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. So what I'm seeing here is some of the hidden manna to eat. In some way, if they repent and overcome this thing, they will have a more intimate relationship with Jesus. They will have manna they didn't know about before. A greater relationship with him. And then this white stone, I don't know. I will give him a white stone. Okay. I remember when remember when pet rocks were popular? <laughs> Man, I know people that made a fortune selling pet rocks. And then they'd have this little rock that had a little face on it and said, turn me over. And you'd turn it over and would say, thank you. Just fun with stones. Well, here, this is a serious stone. This is a white stone that has uh, a new name written on it, a new name no one knows except him who receives it. Some kind of information that we're going to be given when we overcome some of the junk that we've got in the church. Um, did you know when we get to chapter 3 and we read about the church in Philadelphia, he says this, Him who overcomes, I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. Oh, Jesus gets a new name. Well, it makes perfect sense if you think about it. What does the word, what does the name Jesus mean? It, it is the Greek uh, translation of the Hebrew Joshua, Jehovah Shua, God saves. Well, by the time we get into the kingdom, everybody that's going to be saved is saved. So he doesn't need to be God who saves anymore. Now he's going to have a new name. I don't know what it's going to be, but I We'll find out. So this new name thing, interesting stuff. Anyway, all this to say, I hope that with all of this government intervention, restricting what churches can and cannot do, that we don't feel so crippled by it, that we forget we are the church. Amen. And when you look around, we've come an awfully far away from what the church was when it first began. There is much need in the church to repent. Now is the time to hear and to do. So with that in mind, by the way, the keepers of your church, I know that Jesus is the head of the church and those that take on ministries like pastors and teachers, prophets, evangelists, apostles, they all report to him. But the best way that church leaders can be held accountable is from a mature flock that understands the word, knows what it says, and won't let any nonsense in for any length of time. So I thank you all for being that mature group that keeps me in the word, on the word, and where else is there to go? Who else has words of life? Anyway, thank you for listening, and God bless you. Have a